Hi everyone, this is Simon Turpin of Answers in Genesis UK and thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be talking about a very exciting new book, Traced, Human DNA's Big Surprise. And I've got with me the author, Dr. Nathaniel Jeanson. And Nathaniel will be taking us through an overview of the book. And so if you haven't yet got this book, you might want to go to the Answers in Genesis web store. You can see that on the link um, below and make sure you get your copy as soon as possible. But we're going to have an overview of this exciting book today. And Nathaniel Jeanson will be um, given a presentation. Nathaniel. Thank you very much, Simon. And just for our audience, that to reiterate the, the overarching purpose of this lecture, it'll be part of a YouTube playlist in which we'll elaborate on many of the points that I'm making today even further. My goal in this talk is to give you a flavor of the first and foremost point of this book. We'll spend about 40 minutes on that, talking about its implications for history. And then I've got about eight other points I'll make rather quickly near the end that deal with other implications of the book, the, the ramifications of this research. And again, this isn't a, a testimony to me as much as it's a testimony to what the biblical framework and the 4,500 year time scale for human history can do for science. Mm -hmm. But there'll be a lot more in this YouTube playlist you can find on the Answers in Genesis YouTube channel that elaborates on these points. I can also say that there'll be even more videos coming depending on when you, when you access this playlist that'll go through and give you a preview as, about of as much of the book as possible. We'll eventually get to also some of the responses from the critics in this series. So there's, there's, a, there's a ton at your fingertips to access related to this research. I would argue, and you can evaluate for yourself, that we are at a watershed moment in the creation evolution debate, a watershed moment for understanding of human history. And this has massive ramifications going forward. So without further ado, I want to walk you through some of the highlights from this new book, Traced Human DNA's Big Surprise. And before I get into some of the details, I want to put it in an even wider context to justify, in a sense, what I've just said about this being a watershed moment in the creation evolution debate. Four and a half years ago, I published another book, October 2017, called Replacing Darwin. And the thesis of that book is exactly what the title implies, that creation scientists have moved on from simply defending Genesis and rebutting Darwin to proposing, advancing, testing, and confirming ideas that surpass him. One of the major features of this book is showing how the creation science model makes bona fide testable predictions. And a few months after this book was published, this book, of course, excuse me, back up a moment here. This book focuses, of course, on the broader question of the origin of species. Well, one of the icons of the origin of species, at least in modern times, Darwin's finches, it was announced for this spe for, for this group of finches that a new species had been formed, the observ or, or the, the formation of a new species had been observed. It was announced in Science Magazine, January 2018. And if you look at the details of this paper, the timing of the formation of this species or the rate at which these finches were forming new species, as well as the mechanism by which these new species formed, both fit exactly what I'd put in print just a few just a few months prior in replacing Darwin. You can find these articles on our website, answersingenesis.org. Just type in bombshell. You should come up with that article that talks about the timing. The second bombshell is that second article dealing with the mechanism. And so this was encouraging for me that creation scientists were on the right track when it came to biology. I tell you all that background because another prediction that I made in this book dealt with human history. And on the question of human origins and human history, what I hope to show you in this video and hopefully what you see in the book and perhaps in other videos in this series is that creationist ideas are now performing even better than expected. Creationists are now making major scientific discoveries. So defense, then offense, and that, or I should say defense, rebutting Darwin, then replacing Darwin, and now taking the lead on major scientific questions. And in this case, as it deals with human origins and human history, I would argue that creation scientists are not adding just new chapters, but new volumes to our understanding of the past. And so in the, in the next 40 minutes or so, I want to focus heavily on one of these major volumes and give you a taste of it. And once I've done that, because that's the major focus of the book, I want to talk about 
eight other ramifications briefly at the end that, that you'll see in more detail in the book, as well as in other videos in this YouTube playlist, this, this series. To illustrate this new volume that creation scientists are contributing to our understanding of our past, I want to focus on the question of one of the most popular, well-known civilizations in the world, that of ancient Egypt. My last history course I took in high school, and if you're like me and you took history in high school and took world history, you likely heard, heard uh, or learned a history that focused primarily on politics, culture, religion, everything basically but the people themselves. And what I mean is this, typical history course will tell you, here's when Egypt was founded. Here are the major pharaohs. Here's the dynasties. Here's the culture, the religious practices, the beliefs, the monumental structures that they've built. Those, of course, catch a lot of attention. Some of the mysteries of ancient Egypt. And here's when ancient Egypt fell. And what's missing from all of that is the story of the Egyptian peoples themselves. For example, who did the ancient Egyptians come from? What's their origin? Now, you might say, well, we learned that in history class. Egypt is one of the major cradles of civilization. There's several sites in the globe where there was a concentration of humanity and, and civilization got going. Egypt, as you can see on this map, is one of them. Ancient Sumer, the Minoans would be another, the Indus River Valley, your Indian Pakistan, the Yellow River Valley in China, the Olmecs of Mexico, these are all cradles. Egypt falls in that category. Well, that answer simply bumps our question back one step. What were the Egyptians doing before they birthed a cradle of civilization? History books don't seem to cover this. The other end of the question is fast forward through that long political history of Egypt, the Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom. Once Egypt is overthrown by invaders from Asia and is ruled by Europeans, what happened to the Egyptian people themselves, or to make it personal, are the modern Egyptians, the descendants of these ancient African peoples? And these questions aren't as simple as they might first sound. And to show you what I mean, I want us to reflect for a moment on the nature of that ancient Egyptian political entity and kingdom and civilization. And the first thing I want you to notice is that that great civilization was an African one. It's pretty obvious when you just look at it on a map. It was centered around the Nile River, which of course is in Northeast Africa. It's part of the African continent. Modern Egypt still exists in Africa. The pharaohs themselves were Africans. Some were Libyans, some were Kushites. Occasionally invaders from Asia came in and interrupted these this pharaonic rule. But by and large, it's African dynasties that we're talking about when we talk about this series of pharaohs. You think about the major monuments of Egypt, the Valley of the Kings, the Great Pyramids of Giza. These are built by African people. When we talk about hieroglyphics, we're talking about in African language. When we're talking about this whole complex series of deities that the Egyptians worship, these are African deities. And the reason I emphasize this point so strongly is because that geographic element of all this undergoes a fundamental change in around the 600s BC when the Assyrians invade from Asia. This is a map of the growth of the Assyrian kingdom. The main thing I want to draw your attention to is this teal and blue element of the Assyrian rule. You can see responds in case you can't read it to the expansion of Haddon in 675 BC and another uh, Assyrian ruler when they came in and sacked Egypt. So Egypt is overthrown in the 600s BC by Asian invaders, but this time, this spells the beginning of the end for that long-standing series of African rulers. The African Egyptians eventually overthrow or throw off the Assyrian rule, and there's conflict for about a century. Then eventually the, per excuse me, the Persians come in, and you can see here as part of the Persian empire, it includes Egypt. Persia conquers Egypt in 525 BC. Over the next two centuries or so, there's back and forth rebellions on the part of the Egyptians against the Persians. The next major event in this sequence, as it relates to ancient Egypt, is the overthrow of the Persians by Alexander the Great. This is what brings the African pharaonic rule to a permanent end. Of course, Alexander himself does not last very long, dies, I think, in Baghdad. His kingdom is broken up among his various generals. 
And so Egypt then is ruled not by Africans, but by the people running Alexander's army. And of course, the Greeks themselves are eventually overthrown by the Romans. So Egypt, as you can see on this map here, is once is, is ruled again by Europeans. The Roman rule is eventually thrown off by not Africans, but Asians, invaders from the Arabian Peninsula, Muhammad and his followers, you can see her conquer Egypt, parts of North Africa. Long story short, when we fast forward later in history, there's, there's Turkic rulers who arise during the Middle Ages and such, much closer to the present, before Egypt has independence, you can see here it's the Ottoman Turks of Asian origin who are ruling the Egyptian people. So this is about 2000, 2005, so about two and a half millennia after the great pharaohs have come and gone, where Egypt is ruled by foreigners, Asians, Europeans. And so it's worth asking the question anew, when we investigate the origin of modern Egyptians, do they have any connection to the pharaohs of old, to the Egyptian people of old, who get all the news and the press? And just to reiterate this point, how different modern Egypt looks from ancient Egypt. Today, rulers don't build pyramids to commemorate their rules after they die. The language that the people speak is Arabic, which of course harkens back to the Arab Muslim invasions, not to the uh, African hieroglyphic language. The dominant religion is not the religion of the ancient Egyptians. It's the religion of the Arab Muslim conquerors, Islam. If you go to modern Egypt today, there's a strong Asian flavor not so much the ancient African one. So who are the modern Egyptians? Who do they, and, and who were the ancient Egyptians? We're gonna start by trying to ask and answer the question, who did modern Egyptians descend from in hopes that we'll find a lineage, a genealogical connection back to the ancient Egyptians, which would then allow us to go back and ask the question, who do these ancient peoples come from? The goal here is to fill in the rest of the story of history, the part that I never learned growing up in school which as we'll soon see, part of the reason I never learned it, you probably never learned it, is because you need DNA to do it. And we've only recently acquired the tools. And what we're gonna see here is the effectiveness of these tools depends very strongly on the overall time scale that a researcher invokes when doing this sort of investigation. Now, we've got here an endorsement at the top of my book saying that uh, I found the Rosetta Stone of human history. What we're referring to, and this will be the theme now going forward in this lecture, is a DNA-based generation by generation family tree for global humanity. This is based on the Y chromosome, male inherited DNA. And if you're wondering how DNA can be used to reconstruct a family tree, just reflect briefly for a moment on what traditional family trees record. It's obvious if you just think about it, in one element, in, in, in one sense, what family trees record is the who of human history. What is the name of your parent, of your dad, of your mom, of your grandmother, of your grandfather? The who of human history. It also records a time element implicitly. Just the terms I used already have a generational component to them. Mother and father means one generation prior. Grandmother, grandfather, two generations prior, great-grandmother, great-grandfather, three generations prior. So the who question and the time question are what traditional family trees record. DNA can do the same thing. I don't think I have to justify the fact that DNA records the who of human history. The popularity of genetic testing is so great that I think everyone just takes for granted now that DNA tells you who you came from. We use paternity testing to resolve questions of who the father is. It just commonplace in today's world. So there's one element that DNA records that a traditional family tree does as well. What about the time component? In this case, since we're focusing on the Y chromosome in particular, the way in which the male inherited DNA, the Y chromosome records time is straightforward. Every generation, and I'll get more to some of this either in this lecture or in, in later lectures, some of the details of this, every generation when fathers pass on DNA to their sons, when the sperm stem cells in dad copy DNA and pass it on, and they eventually end up in his offspring, there are mistakes that are made. On average, out of about 10 million Y chromosome letters, the 10 million we have easy access to with modern technology, it's, it's 60 million letters long, but 
there's only a subsection that modern technology can reliably assess. Out of those 10 million letters, only about three mistakes happen per generation. Not that much, really a, a, a literal needle in a haystack. But that's enough then to mark off time. If you compare my Y chromosome to one of my sons, on average, you'd find about three differences. If you were to compare my son's Y chromosome to my dad's, his grandfather, two generations ago, you should find on average about six DNA differences. So if you compare my Y chromosome to any of you males watching, we can count the number of differences between us and figure out approximately how many generations ago we shared a common ancestor. That's the principle. DNA records the who of human history and the Y chromosome in this manner also records a time element. So this diagram that you see here on the screen is a Y chromosome based tree and it comes from comparing the Y chromosomes among 600 men from around the globe. In this case, in this example, you have people, you have Native Americans, you have people from Europe, you have North Africans, Sub-Saharan Africans, Middle Easterners, Central Asians, East Asians, people from New Guinea. This is a pretty good sampling, a pretty good swath of the ethnic diversity that exists on our planet today. 600 men, you get their Y chromosome sequence, you compare them, you count the number of differences, and you plug those numbers into a program, say, give us a graphical de depiction of the DNA differences among these various men, and this is what emerges. And you can see even from this zoomed out view, it has the appearance of a branching structure that looks like a family tree, where the beginning of the family tree is up here near the top, and the present is closer here to the bottom. Now, why the various colors and, and letters and numbers and labels and such? Well, the mainstream community has adopted a sort of shorthand to tell us exactly where we are in the tree at any given moment. As a general rule of thumb, deep branches are assigned semi-arbitrary letters of the alphabet. So you can see here in blue, there's a fairly deep branch going back deep in history, and it's separate uh, from this yellow branch, N. So O here in blue, N in yellow. There's some really deep branches right here, S, or the, or the, the uh, teal one is M. There's, a, I think, a single K lineage, and, and S in green, hard to see. Over here might be easier because there's more men represented. Q in these pink branches is separate from R. And here's where the methodology becomes more relevant. R subdivides, and when a branch subdivides, you assign then a number. So on this side is R1, here's R2. When this subdivides further, then you add a letter. R1A in lavender, R1B in this brownish green, and so on and so forth until you get a very long string of letter number, letter number, letter, letter number alterations. Not pretty, but it tells you in an instance, at a glance, exactly where you are in the tree. What we want to do in the next few minutes is walk through the history embedded in one of these branches, one that's most relevant to modern Egyptians, in the hopes that we'll be able to walk back in time through this branch to see if there's any connection to ancient Egypt. To try to figure out the answer to the question, what happened to the ancient Egyptians? And then going back even further in time, who did they come from? If you were to survey modern Egyptian males, which has been done, this data has been published, there is a branch that is most abundant among them. It's a branch known as E1B1B. It exists in more than 40% of Egyptian males. Now you might say 40% is not even a majority. So why are we even talking about this? And that's the right question to ask. What that means is every other branch that exists among modern Egyptians exists at levels less than 40%. And so to make the math work, a clear implication is there's a tremendous amount of genetic diversity among modern Egyptian males today. Frankly, that's what we see all around the globe in pretty much every single people group that we survey. But it should be no surprise, in light of what I've just discussed, given the somewhat tumultuous history of Egypt, and I'm talking both the ancient times when you had all the pharaohs and various points of invasion during their history, and also the last 2,000, 2,500 years of Egyptian history, where there have been all sorts of foreign invaders time and time again. So what does E1B1B imply or tell us about the history of modern Egyptians? Who do they come from? The first thing I want to show you is a map of where E1B1B exists in the globe today. The size of these circles represents relatively how much E1B one B or at what levels E one B one B exists in various populations. So I mentioned just over forty percent of Egyptian males belong to E one B one B. In Somalia, I think it's close to 
80 percent, 77, 80 percent of Somali males belong to E1B, E1B, so their circle is bigger. You can see the largest circles are here in North Africa. They spill down over here into East Africa. There are some down here in Africa. There are smaller circles over here in the Middle East, also over here into Europe. I've omitted E1B, E1B in the Americas because nearly all of it, from what I can tell, is due to recent European colonialism or to the ugly history of the transatlantic slave trade. I'm interested, for, or, and we're interested for our purposes today, the history of the indigenous peoples. So I've just emitted that sort of data from this particular map. That said, for the rest of the old world, if you don't see a circle, what that means is E1B1B exists at levels of less than 1% or it is entirely undetectable. So there you have it. One of the first things that strikes me about this map, where E1B1B exists and where it doesn't, is its resemblance to the geographic extent of one of the kingdoms that I just mentioned a few minutes ago, that of the Arab Muslims. Mohammedanist followers came out of the Arabian Peninsula, conquered parts of North Africa into Spain. They, they went the other direction as well, over here to the borders of India, up here into Central Asia. And so if you look at where the Arab Muslims went, and where they didn't, there's an intriguing overlap with where E1B1B exists and where it doesn't. It exists in North Africa, up here into Europe, part of the Middle East, over here into Central Asia. Sure, it exists beyond that as well, all the way up into Scandinavia, down here into South Africa. But there's enough of a correlation where I think it'd be worth our while to ask the question, is there any other data that might imply a connection to this period of Asian and North African history. And so what I want to do now is zoom in on this section of the tree. Again, we're zoomed way out here so we can see the, the data from all 600 men that are part of this particular study. And I'm going to zoom in on the branches right here. I should clarify, by the way, these data right here are drawn from multiple studies. And I give the documentation in the book. I've been focusing on this tree from 600 men because it's a nice summary of the data we have from around the globe. I want to now zoom in on this section of the tree to show you the details. I'm going to change the coloring scheme here briefly so you, you can see what I want to highlight. Same color here coming in, but then I'm, I've, I've assigned separate colors to the, to the major sub-branches here. You'll notice that the date I've assigned, 300s to 600s AD, is when you see this major uh, bifurcation or separation of these branches. What I want you to notice is something that'll be hard to unsee once it clicks. May not be obvious at first glance, but there's a key clue embedded in the history in the family tree branches of E1B1B. And if you're a Christian, you're a creationist watching this, I want to explain it by analogy to a familiar biblical concept, biblical family tree. If you're not familiar, well, this is the example I'm using. Think of the history of Israel and their origins, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob then has 12 sons, which have become the ancestors of the 12 tribes of Israel. So if you were to draw out the male family tree for Jacob and his sons, because again, we're focusing on the Y chromosome, you've got one branch from Jacob down and, and multiplying into 12 branches, leading to his 12 sons. You take the names away, that basic, fundamental, simple mathematical fact emerges, and the point that I want you to see is that family trees not only record the who of human history and the time of human history, timing of your ancestry, but also there's an inherent, thirdly, implicit element of changes in population size. This is a really simple point. You go from one dad to 12 sons, great explosion in the number of males and, and going from one generation to the next. This simple principle is true not only for nuclear families, but for families around the globe. And so when we go to E1B1B and revisit the diagram that we just looked at, what does this section of the tree imply? You've got one branch, and then in the 300s to 600s AD, one, two, three branches. It multiplies. It increases threefold. It implies some sort of population growth in that point in history. Now, why does this matter? I now want to show you some graphs based not on genetics, but on mainstream 
history, historical records, and mainstream archaeology for the Middle East. And what I want you to see is that there's a unique population history for the Arabian Peninsula, the site, the origin of the Arab Muslims when they went about and, and, and went on their Muslim uh, on their conquests in the early Middle Ages. First, first thing I want to show you here is how I've broken up the various sections of the Middle East. I've got the Arabian Peninsula here in the upper left. Upper right here is at, at sort of the heart of the Middle East, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, Iraq, and then two of the other major countries, Turkey and Iran. And just to refresh our memory, the Arabian Peninsula would include the modern countries of Saudi Arabia and, and Yemen and Oman and the UAE and, and other countries. The heart of the Middle East would basically be that section, those countries. And then, of course, I've included Turkey and Iran. So basically entire Middle East broken up into four sections. And this is their population histories. You'll see there's two lines in each of these four graphs. I'm going to zoom in here more in a moment so that you can see the details. I'll explain those uh, in, in just a second. What I want you to notice is what each of these graphs have, have in common. On the horizontal axis for each is the time element number here. In each case, the far left and most the leftmost number here, a negative number, negative 200, is 200 BC. Then going to the right, all these numbers are positive. They're AD. I've included the year zero here, even though it doesn't exist, just because it's easier to graph in Excel. So you have the time element on the horizontal axis and the population sizes on the vertical axis. And these absolute values differ in these various places because the population histories have been different in these various places. So it's in terms of millions, 2 million, 4 million, 6 million, 8 million people, 5 million, 10 million, 40 million, 40 million. That's what's going on here. So you've got a graph of how the populations have risen and fallen with time in these various locations. Another point of commonality among these various locations is the overall shape. All of them have at their rightmost element a sudden shooting upward. And this is true basically everywhere you go around the globe. In the last 600 years, the global population has increased 20-fold. It's been this massive spike. Each of these graphs have basically a, a hockey stick shape to them. Now, I want to zoom in because the, the magnitude of this recent growth tends to swamp out all that occurred prior. And you can't see the details quite as much. So I'm going to zoom in and kind of eliminate that last upward spike. That's what you see right here. And here's where the differences, I think, will become more obvious. And also, I'll be able to explain better what the, the dashed line versus the solid line means. The dashed line represents the actual rises and falls in the various location. The black line represents what I'm going to call the effective or minimum population growth curve. The reason I'm doing this is because when we look at these family trees, we're looking at family trees based on the DNA from living men. In other words, we're looking at the DNA from the survivors of human history. So, fine, maybe the heart of the Middle East had a population rise that peaked in the 800s AD, but then it dropped suddenly. And many of these men likely did not leave descendants. Effectively, the men who survived to this point are the ones who left descendants to this day. And so, if you're trying to infer what's going on in the family trees of the survivors of human history, you want to compare apples to apples, so to speak. So the, the dashed line represents the actual rises and falls. The solid black line represents the part that matters based on the DNA that we're looking at. Okay, now that I've told you why I'm focusing on the black lines, the solid lines, Here's where I want you to see the differences among these various regions and how the Arabian Peninsula stands out as an outlier. Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, Iraq, their history is essentially flat because of this very late population collapse for due to various causes, Mongol invasions, Black Death, and so forth. Effectively, a flat line for 1,600 years, slight rise, flat again, and then late in history, boom, it shoots up. Similar history in Turkey and Iran, flat for 1,600 years or so, and then a rise, flat, and then a permanent rise. Turkey, flat for uh, 1,300 years, slight rise, if, if, if effectively 1,600 years, and then the permanent rise. The Arabian Peninsula also has a flat element, or basically flat element with a rise, but it's preceded by 
not a flat line, but from 200 BC here in this graph up to about 500 AD, a population rise. This early population rise versus effectively flat population growth is what sets the Arabian Peninsula apart. And so the fact that we see a flat line and then a tripling of the population sizes is evidence consistent with the origin of E1B1B in the Arabian Peninsula, not elsewhere in the Middle East. And once again, or just, just to emphasize another element of this, notice that in the 200s BC, the population numbers in the Arabian Peninsula are about 1.5 million. By the time you get about to the 500s, it's grown to over 4 million. Well, 1.5 times 2 would be 3. 1.5 times 3 would be 4.5. So what we see here effectively is a grow, about a threefold population growth in the Arabian Peninsula. And we've gone from one branch to three branches right around the same time. An additional line of evidence that seems to can suggest that E1B1B has something to do with the political history of the Arab Muslims. So that's two lines of evidence now. The, the moderate correlation between where the Arab Muslims once were, where their kingdom once was, and where E1B1B exists today, especially at its highest levels. Secondly, the population history embedded in the family tree branches of E1B1B. And thirdly, I don't have time to go through this in any sort of detail, but if you look at where Afro-Asiatic languages are spoken today, why would I talk about Afro-Asiatic Afro languages and what does it have to do with anything? Arabic is a language from the Arab Arabian Peninsula that belongs to the Afro-Asiatic language family. There's an, there's an overlap linguistically and genetically here. This would be a third line of evidence. All that to say, and I've, I've zoomed through that just for sake of time, E1B1B seems to have originated, at least going back to the 600s AD, in the Arabian Peninsula. No surprise again, modern Egypt has Arabic as a language. It's dominantly Muslim. Should we expect anything different for the genetics of modern Egyptians to be dominated by something that came out of Arabia? And another point I want to make here is it seems to have come out of Arabia, not Africa. So we could stop our story here and our investigation here and say, let's move on and look for something else. Maybe the signature of the ancient Egyptians is one of these other branches that exists at lower levels among modern Egyptians. But I don't want to stop the story yet because I've only taken you back to the 600s AD with E1B1B. If we take, if, if we go back even further, the deeper history of E1B1B, it gets quite intriguing. In, in this particular tree, the next major point of connection, which the date here is the 700s BC to 400s BC, takes you over to a branch that I've labeled here E1B1A. Okay, so what? Work with me here. E1B1A is one of the most dominant lineages in Sub-Saharan Africa, Africa today. These are large circles here. Nigerian men, I think over 90% of them belong to E1B1A. Because of the ugly history of the transatlantic slave trade, I think about 60% of African-American males belong to E1B1A. This is very dominantly sub-Saharan African lineage. If we overlay it with language again, languages can be classified into higher and higher categories. Family is the one I'm using here. There is a language family that contains a whole bunch of African languages in this sort of tan color, Niger, Congo, yellowish tan color. Bantu is a subset of that, which I'll get to in a moment. But if you look where the Niger, Congo languages exist and where the highest levels of E1B1A exist, there's a pretty strong correlation. This will become relevant, more relevant, in a moment, I'm going to return to this question or this concept of the Bantu subgroup of Niger Congo languages. And I'm going to give you a quote from a mainstream historian, no creationist that I know of, in which he talks about how the mainstream view of the Bantu language origin has changed with time. So, Kevin Shillington, I've got his textbook on the history of Africa. He says, before the development of radiocarbon dating, and the widespread archaeological research that has taken place since the 1950s, it was believed that Bantu speakers spread across Eastern, Central, and Southern Africa in the comparatively recent past. How recent? Well, here's, here's what he says. The main source of evidence was oral traditions, 
which seldom trace ruling lineages back more than 500 years. So just to pause here for a moment and summarize, Shillington is saying people used to think that this Bantu language group had originated fairly recently because of oral traditions, but that's changed, he says. It was assumed, therefore, that to have populated the subcontinent in so short a time, there must have been large-scale conquering migrations of whole new peoples. And just to add some detail here on this view, based on linguistics, it's thought that the, the Bantu speakers were originally up here in the Nigeria area, and based on oral tradition, would have then spread down here into Central and Southern Africa in the last few centuries. It says, no, we don't think that anymore because of radiocarbon dating. Well, here's what's intriguing to me. If you look at the E1B1A branching structure and the dates and the geography of E1B1A at these various dates, there's a pattern that emerges. Some of the earliest branches in E1B1A belong to West African peoples. In this particular study, you had Mandenkas from Guinea, this country way out here, far Western Africa. I've highlighted them, their branches in pink. Other members of the study include Yorubans from Nigeria, Bantu speakers from Kenya. You have Bianca Pygmies. I'm trying to see who else is here in this, in this study. You have a sampling of Sub-Saharan Africa. And some of the earliest branches, and, and other studies have confirmed this, some of the earliest branches belong to the West African peoples and subsequent branches. So here again, this branch to the Mandenka up here, 1200s to 1400s, the separation between these pink ones and the, and the rest of them, 14 to 1600s. 1400 separating branches from these ones over here. It seems that E1B1A was West African originally. And then about the 1400s, 1500s, you see branches out here in Kenya and in the jungles of Central Africa. You do see some Yorubans and such. It has this intriguing pattern that is reminiscent of what mainstream history would say about the origin of the Bantu peoples starting out here, West African, and then going here just a few centuries ago. Now, this is an agreement then with the oral histories of the peoples themselves. Shillington says, based on archaeology, we're revising that. Can archaeology actually tell you the who of human history? It can tell you dinner plate patterns and such. Can it tell you who made these patterns? Now, I'm emphasizing this point for a number of reasons. Number one, you can see clear echoes of indigenous history in this Y chromosome tree. Number two, you see them only if you have the overall young earth time scale. If you were to convert these dates, or excuse me, if you were to ask the question, what are the dates assigned to these branches within a mainstream view of history? These would go back thousands of years. I think even before the origins of the first civilizations. You'd completely lose this history of migrations and correlations with the Bantu speakers. But you see it when you have the Young Earth timescale. This, this, is, this is a timescale that works and makes sense of human history. Okay. Bantu speakers start up here. Genetically, it looks like the earliest branches of E1B1B B are in West Africa. Later ones are down here in Central and Southern Africa. There's this clear echo. Okay. Okay. I forgot to mention this. So, I've got the dates in my notes. Mainstream timescale would put these dates not just a few centuries ago, but 6,000 to 10,000 years ago. The Young Earth dates are the ones that work. The, e, the, the point I'm driving at is that E1B1A appears to be the genetic echo of the Bantu expansion. And you only see this when you have the Young Earth timescale. So this would seem to put the origin of E1B1A out here in West Africa, at least, at least several. So Let's stop and reflect on this. E1B1A seems to fit the history of the Bantu expansion. It seems to then imply that in the 1500s, 1400s, 1200s, E1B1A, those people were in Nigeria, Cameroon, West Africa area. I just mentioned a few minutes ago, we concluded that E1B1B has multiple lines of evidence pointing towards its origins in Arabia. Yet somehow, these two branches were once in the same spot. Why do I say that? Because they share a common ancestor in the 700s to 400s BC. So to put this on a map so you can see what we're talking about, I'm saying 1500s would put E1B1A individuals out here. In the 600s AD, the E1B1B individuals were probably right here. And then 
expanded across North Africa, Middle East, into Europe, into Central Asia as the result of these conquests. Where is the most likely spot of origin for the ancestor to both of these groups? Notice that the geography connecting them is almost exclusively African. And the line, straight line that would connect them, these two places goes through Sudan and Eritrea. That's interesting to me because if you go back in time to history that precedes the dates I've given for both of these. So I said, I can trace you back to the 1500s AD for E1B1A. I can go back to the 600s AD for E1B1B. Go back before both of these in this section of the globe and you have a kingdom known as Aksum that connects Northeast Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. This would seem to fit and imply an origin of E1B1B and E1B1A, the ancestors to them, somewhere over here in Africa with, in the first few centuries after Christ, some of E1B1B ending up in the Arabian Peninsula. And if we had time, I could tell you about some subsequent work that seems to confirm exactly that, even earlier branches of E1B1B than the ones I've shown you in this particular study that are found right here, exactly as I would have predicted. The point I'm driving at in, 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 in this right here suggests that the ancestors of both these groups lived somewhere up here. If we had time, and I go through this in the book, I could give you geographic reasons why this seems to fit, given how Africa is surrounded by water, and then in the north has the Saharan Desert to keep invaders out, and the most likely point of origin for entry into Africa from the outside is down here through northeastern Africa. All that to say, the data seem to put these people, the ancestors to these groups, in northeastern Africa. And then something happens apparently in the 700s to 400s BC that sends them on their separate ways. What possibly could have happened? Well, this time frame just so happens to overlap with a period of Egyptian history in which the pharaohs were of Nubian origin. Nubia would be basically modern Sudan. The 25th dynasty of Egypt from about the 7... 20s, 719 BC to the 650s BC was these were these dark-skinned individuals from Sudan. And that is right in line with the dates right here. Now, why does it end in the 650s BC? It ends because of the invasion that I referred to earlier in this lecture, the Assyrians. The Assyrians come, come in, they sack Egypt, drive out the Nubian pharaohs. Perhaps this is what sent and then split up this population into two groups and sent them on their way, as the genetics seem to imply. So just to summarize, E1B1, the ancestor to E1B1A and E1B1B appears to have been in the first millennium BC up this way, and then later on split into these two groups. My point is, most, or excuse me, the plurality of Egyptian males belong to E1B1B, if you go back 1,600, 1,400 years, you would conclude that the plurality of Egyptian males are Asian in origin and not African. However, the Arabs themselves, at least in part, appear to have originated from a Northeast African group who themselves may have sat on the throne of ancient Egypt. So it does seem that after all, the plurality of Egyptian males are indeed African in origin. A part of Africa that is in close geographic proximity to ancient Egypt and implies some sort of connection. So this sort of messy interconnectedness implies that modern Egyptians may indeed be the descendants of some of the pharaohs of old. This is the type of thing you can do for, in theory, any other civilization any other people group on the planet. That's the main thing this book Traced does. It's first and foremost a history book that fills in the story that I never learned in school, that you may have not ever learned in school, the history of the peoples of the planet. Not just the politics, the religion, the culture, but the peoples themselves. I've filled in part of the rest of the story for the ancient Egyptians. We'll get to that to the, to the early question, the, the origin of these peoples in a moment. What I wanna walk through now very quickly in the few minutes that we have together that remain, is some of the other major ramifications of this new Rosetta Stone of human history, this DNA-based generation by generation family tree for global humanity 
that just so happens to record history within the Young Earth time scale. And, and in future episodes of, of this YouTube series, we're going to talk about some of the scientific backstory to this, as well as some of the responses to the critics. What I want to do now is very quickly sketch some of the other ramifications that, again, subsequent episodes in this series will go into more detail. So to give you a, a metaphor in a sense, this new Rosetta Stone holds many secrets. The first secret is the history of the peoples of the globe. The second secret is what I'm going to call the prehistory of peoples. So if you're a creationist, you might associate the term prehistory with cavemen or uh, you know, dinosaurs or prehistoric. There's, in a sense, an ambiguity, I guess, in this term prehistory, because it's used to refer to things that creationists would reject millions of years of history. It's also used in human history context to refer simply to the era before written records. And that's the fundamental meaning of it. So if you're a creationist, we might use the term prehistory to refer to the post-Babel pre-written records era. Pre-Columbian history is one of the perhaps most, most well-known eras that fits this description. Sure, creationists would say the Native Americans originated after the confusion of languages at Babel. Some eventually landed in the Americas. But either they didn't write their history down, or if they did, it was lost, destroyed. Pre-Columbian era is considered, in mainstream science, a prehistory pre era because of this lack of written records different from other parts of the globe. This new Rosetta Stone has explosive ramifications for how we understand this era. I've got a whole other video on this that, that I encourage you to see. And again, it's, it, there's a whole chapter on this in the book. Today's Native Americans do not appear to have been the first. There have been multiple settling, settlings of the Americas. And it appears, just like we saw for the, for the Bantu-speaking peoples in Africa, the Native Americans themselves have written this down. And it's been neglected by mainstream science or completely rejected because it doesn't seem to fit the time scale or for whatever reasons they invoke. When you've got this new Rosetta Stone, the data match up in a remarkable way. And there's, again, so much more we could talk about. I don't have time to do so in this lecture. The same sort of analyses with major ramifications you can do in other parts of the globe that are currently under the label prehistory, pre-colonial Africa, pre-colonial Pacific, these sorts of things. There's, there's major ramifications here. One of the secrets of the new Rosetta Stone is on what we can understand and learn about so-called prehistory. Third secret of this new Rosetta Stone. I'm going fast, again, for sake of time, and there's subsequent lectures that cover this in more detail. If you look at the biblical history of the globe, and read it, read the Bible in a straightforward way. It says humanity starts with Adam and Eve 6,000 years ago. Their descendants multiply. Eventually, they go wicked. God decides to destroy everyone on the planet except Noah, his wife, his sons, and their wives. They restart after this global flood. And Genesis 10 records the male descendants of Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And for, again, reasons I don't have time to go into, I would argue that these 70 or so names in Genesis 10, represent the earliest heads of the ethno-linguistic groups that were separated at the Tower of Babel. I've just zoomed through a bunch of biblical history for sake of time. My point is, these are at the fountainhead of the human race after the flood, according to the Bible. And, and, and this diagram right here represents just a, just a facsimile, basically, of the genealogical details in Genesis 10. In chapter 13 of this book, so 12 goes through Native American history, chapter 13 of Traced, I walk through multiple independent lines of evidence that show at the base of the Y chromosome tree, there's almost a mirror image of that history. It's it's remarkable to me. The subtitle of this book is Human DNA's Big Surprise. There are, There's many surprises. We could have made it plural in this book. This is one of the biggest shocks to me. This is, uh, I, I had an early draft of this book in, in February, 2021 that didn't have this data and a deeper study of the scriptural data in, in April of 2021 led me to a number of other biblical lines of evidence to, to a deeper understanding of what the Bible says about the fate of these men in Genesis 10. And with that biblical data on hand and the history I'd already worked out for the Y chromosome, there's this tremendous overlap that emerged. And you can see the details again in chapter 13. In theory, every single people group on this planet can trace their ancestry back to specific men in Genesis 10. And here's where I can fill in then the beginning of the story of ancient Egypt, or really the beginning of the story of E1B1B and its ancestor E1B1. 
Mizraim is listed in Genesis 10. Mizraim is who the Bible identifies as the ancestor of the Egyptians. Does the E branch trace back to Mizraim himself? Mizraim was a son of Ham. And the way I've worked this tree out, E1B1B is on the Hamitic side of the tree, as is E1B1A. Zooming in here so you can see that names from Genesis 10, there's Mizraim. Cush is also a son of Ham. This the scripture seems to imply that Cush gave rise to the Sudanese, the Ethiopians, the, these Northeast Africans, Mizraim again, to the Egyptians. I don't yet have a precise answer. There's some more data still to be gathered. If I had to guess, I would say E1B1B is likely from Cush, not from Mizraim. But then again, Cush and Mizraim, Cush and Egypt, the Nubians and the Egyptians had a constant back and forth throughout their ancient histories. So it's almost six of one, half a dozen of the other when you when you think about how history has played out after Babel. Third secret of this Rosetta Stone is the genetic echo of Noah and his descendants as recorded in Genesis 10 at the base of the Y chromosome tree. There's another biblical echo in this tree that I'm calling a separate secret. Zooming in here on the Semitic line, traced down in Genesis 10 through our facts, said Salah, Eber, and Peleg. If you go to the genealogy, genealogical data in Genesis 11, Peleg's offspring are traced down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And once again, you have an exquisite genealogical detail, which I give again in, in chapter 13 of the book. That echo, which implies then that there's branches of the tree that represent the direct genealogical descendants of Abraham. There may be a little bit of ambiguity whether or not this is Isaac or Ishmael. I, in the book, I lean towards it being Isaac, Jacob, and such. It's clearly Abrahamic, whichever way you take it. That's a remarkable echo that you can see in the tree as well. Fourth secret of, the new, of, of this new Rosetta Stone. Fifth secret, an application of what I've just described to you. You and I, if you're a male, can be found on this tree. I've had my Y chromosome tested like so many people of Western European descent, I belong to R1B or my family line belongs to R1B. I can tell you that R1B goes back to one of the sons of Jockton, who is a descendant of Shem. That's the type of thing you can do. You can, And, and I should clarify here, because I've had uh, many people write to me about this sort of research. I think all of us tend to assume there is one son of Noah that we come from. And if I, if I take a Y chromosome test, I'm going to find the one son of Noah that I come from. Well, all of us have a complicated family tree, multiple genealogical inputs. The Y chromosome represents just a single line of unbroken male descent that I've tried to highlight here in this diagram. My Y chromosome we got from my dad, who got it from his dad, who got it from his dad, and on back in the tree. Well, what about my dad's mother's side or my mother's mother's side or my mother's father's side. There's ways to try to access this with the Y chromosome as well. And so if you're a lady watching and you know, how, how are you leaving me out? I'm not. There's there's ways both men and women have to deal with this question. And the way to do it is to find male relatives on that part of the tree. Dad's mother's side, see if you can find dad's mother's brother or dad's mother's brother's son or someone along that part of the tree who can get a Y chromosome test. We've had my mother's brother have his Y chromosome tested. We've been exploring my wife's side of the family tree. My father-in-law has had his Y chromosome tested. My mother-in-law's brother has had his Y chromosome tested. And for some of you, you may not have to do anything. For my father-in-law's mother's side, there was already a Facebook page dedicated to the origin of the family name and multiple males had taken a Y chromosome test. So, so you might be able to uncover your family history just sitting at your computer. The point being, all of us, Every family line can trace their ancestry in theory back to specific sons of Noah. And I want to emphasize this point because there's an element of mystery here that you might be a part of. You might have an answer to a mystery. I said here there's a, there's a mirror image of this genealogy of Genesis 10 in the Y chromosome tree. I should clarify, there are 70 names listed here in Genesis 10. There are not... 70 ancient lineages at the base of the tree yet. 99% of the men on the, on the globe today have yet to get a Y chromosome test. Some of you watching may belong to one of these yet undiscovered ancient lines. You may have in your DNA 
some of the secrets to the lost people of the ancient past, the lost peoples of Genesis 10, who spread out and maybe were conquered or assimilated to other people in, in, in the next 4,000 years of history. So just to stop for a moment, you can trace your ancestry, your family's ancestry back to specific sons of Noah. If you want some help on that, I've set up a web page. It's our homepage, answersingenesis.org slash go slash traced. So if you go to that link, you'll find a little button or you can just scroll down on the page. It's the Hidden History of Every People Project. This is the next phase of the research. Traced really re represents the beginning of what will likely be a lifelong research project. And this will take you down to a place where you enter your name, email, message. I've had probably 400 and over 450 people already email me in this way. This goes directly to my inbox. Many of them saying, hey, I took a Y chromosome test. What does it mean? Or how can I go about doing this? Or what, what, uh, what company do you recommend? Company offers and details change. Some of the best data that I've seen is from 23andMe in terms of resolution of which pre precise branch you use on this Y chromosome tree. We've had, I, I personally used family tree DNA with some of my relatives. They haven't given as, as, as precise a detail. Again, by the time you watch this, offers may change my, my recommendations to explore it or just email me by, via this link to find out where, where things stand currently. So that's the fifth secret of this new Rosetta Stone. Sixth secret comes from this history we just explored. I'm going to summarize it very quickly in terms of its so-called racial and ethnic implications. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that there exist members of E1B1B way up here in Scandinavia. What do Scandinavians look like? Typically pale-faced, light-haired, light-skinned. What we've just seen, though, is that men like this in Scandinavia, some of them, if you trace their ancestry, male ancestry back in time, it goes back to, not the Vikings, but to olive-skinned Arabs who arose in the Arabian Peninsula. We also just saw that some of these olive-skinned Arabs do not trace their ancestry back to Abraham, per se, because they're in the Middle East. If they're on E1B1B, they go back to the ancient Nubians, dark-skinned peoples of Northeast Africa, which again, some of them ruled the throne of ancient Egypt. Tut was not one of them, but there's this complicated, fascinating, glorious history for some Scandinavians. Some Scandinavians have royal Egyptian blood in them. And who would have guessed? These are the sorts of wild implications of uncovering the history of peoples of the globe. It dramatically changes how we think about the concepts of so-called race and ethnicity. My point here is the so-called races have changed multiple times in human history. That's one example. But you can see it all throughout the tree. Dark-skinned people with light-skinned ancestors, light-skinned people with dark-skinned ancestors, Asians who have African ancestry, Africans with Asian, and on and on the, the mix-up goes. Imagine if every school child learned this growing up about human history. How much more difficult would it be for racists to advance a narrative about racial superiority and inferiority? How can you even talk about that if the very terms you're trying to use have undergone multiple changes throughout human history? Very quickly, for sake of time, I've already given you one example, but the seventh secret then of the new Rosetta Stone is that there are countless, or I should say an increasing number of examples of indigenous histories that find loud and clear confirmation in this Y chromosome tree. So if you belong to a minority group and you're watching this, or you might say, hey, I belong to a particular group and I don't know that we have any Y chromosome data, or, or here's what we say about who we came from. would love to have you contact me through that web portal, ancestorsgenesis.org slash go slash traced. I've already had multiple Native Americans contact me. We're developing, in a sense, a, a sort of Native American study group to combine indigenous histories with this genetic data, with linguistic data, with archaeological data, to try to recover the pre-Columbian history of the Americas. I never learned any of that growing up in school. Or may, maybe we briefly touched on the Aztecs and the Incas and the Mayans, but it just was largely a blank slate. We learned about the various tribes that, that the Europeans encountered pushing westward in what's now the United States, but I, I had no concept of their history who they came from, what they were doing for thousands of years. There's a lot of history left to recover. This also has applications to missions, I would argue. So if you're a missionary watching this, you're working with a people group, who do they come from in terms of Genesis 10? Where does their story start? I've already had a couple of missionaries do just that. Would love to hear from more of you. If there's any way I can assist 
or uh, questions that you have, again, go to this website that I mentioned. It goes directly to my inbox, can respond to you directly in that manner. If there's any way I can be of assistance, would love to do it. Eighth secret, eighth and ninth secrets, which have the most explosive apologetic ramifications and take us back to where I started in the context of this book, Replacing Darwin, and the concept of creation scientists now making major scientific discoveries. I don't think I have to tell you that this concept of humanity being just 6,000 years old and more immediately 4,500 years old back to Noah is viewed as ridiculous in, today, in Western society. What this book shows is multiple independent lines of evidence confirming the young earth timescale back to Noah in a manner that answers long-standing evolutionary objections and puts evolution on the defensive. Once we get to some of the videos that talk about the critics' responses, which end up being these great gifts to creation science, we'll see this loud and clear. I've already talked about the echo of Genesis 10 being at the base of this family tree. One of the predictions that I put in replacing Darwin was that you should be able to see the echoes of civilization all throughout our DNA. It's a different expectation than in a very quantitative way, qualitative and quantitative way from evolution. This book is really a book length argument for that. It's primarily a history book, but it has these massive apologetic ramifications. One of the strongest arguments in print for the recent origin of humanity. Now, the last secret I want to set up by asking the question. Number one, why is creation science still not considered mainstream? Why do 99% of evolutionists agree with evolution? Which implies then they would disagree with the conclusions of this book. And why have the efforts of creationists over the years not been successful in, in changing that? Well, one of the things I want you to consider very quickly is what the evolutionists themselves have said in answer to that question. They've long said that creation science isn't science at all, and therefore shouldn't even be allowed in the discussion. Now, if you're a creationist or you've, you've followed the creation evolution debate, you'd say, well, hasn't there been a lot of anti-evolutionary arguments advanced by creation scientists? Yes. I would personally argue that many of them are fairly airtight. Here's where evolution can't explain things. Here's where evolution is impossible. You might also say, well, haven't creation scientists, creationist community advanced large amounts of evidence for design? Yes. Even Richard Dawkins will say that biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Evolutionists recognize life looks designed. They will still say evolution is the explanation for it. So what gives? What needs to change? The evolutionary community has said this is not enough. There's something else that creation scientists need to do before their ideas are considered mainstream. So I'll give you one quote. I could give you more from court decisions from other authors that all say this, emphasize the same theme. Niles Eldridge, a famous paleontologist, wrote an anti-creationist book in 1982. Here's a quote from it that I think succinctly captures one of the longest standing arguments against creation science. He says, creation science isn't science at all, nor have creation scientists managed to come up with even a single intellectually compelling, scientifically testable statement about the natural world. Very briefly, what would they say is science? They'd say gravity is science. They'd say, I've got my cell phone here in my hand. If I release my grip, gravity predicts it'll fall. Of course it does. But in theory, I could have disproven gravity by that experiment. It's testable. Evolutionists would say, fine, creation scientists believe that God created kinds of creatures, that Noah took kinds of creatures on board the ark, that species formed from these kinds that he took on board the ark. Who cares? If you want to be science, if you want to be, if you want those ideas to be considered scientific, make some predictions. Based on that view, predict for us, creationists, how many new species will form this year. That's what they've been demanding for at least four decades. They'd said evidence against evolution for design is not enough. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm saying this is what the evolutionary community has said. Evolutionists have demanded testable predictions. That's exactly what this book does. I won't walk you through this complicated quote, mouthful of a quote, but I put in print four and a half years ago, specific predictions about finding the history of civilization in human DNA I said specifically in the Y chromosome, male inherited DNA, that's exactly what this book does. It, it not only did replacing Darwin have testable predictions, this book fulfills them and makes even more. And again, perhaps one of the biggest fulfilled predictions is this echo of Genesis 10 to the base of the uh, Y chromosome tree. 
Bayesian science is meeting the highest standards for science. That demand for testable predictions isn't some invention of the evolutionary community. That just comes from the basic philosophy of science. That's how science works. So what I'm saying is it's right to demand of any idea that there should be testable predictions. We could ask the question, does evolution make testable predictions, which would be another discussion for another day. We'll talk about the critics here in a moment, or excuse me, in, in a subsequent lecture. But from a creation science alone perspective, has it met the standard? Yes, and it's exceeded them. What else can the evolutionists raise as an objection to this that is philosophically coherent? My answer is they can't come up with any other objection. Creationists have met this objection. They've exceeded it. They're taking the lead in science. They're advancing scientific ideas. They're advancing our knowledge of the world. We're witnessing the dawn of a new era in the creation evolution debate. This is the ninth secret of this new Rosetta Stone, explosive revolutionary ramifications for the wider creation evolution debate. Other lectures in this YouTube playlist you can find talking about other civilizations and the history of those peoples, talking about the prehistory of especially the Native Americans. We we talk about uh, Ken Ham's DNA and, and his origin, whether or not he comes from Japheth or Ham or Shem, and, and how it connects to other sections of the tree. It's an example of being able to uncover your, someone's own personal ancestry. We've got another lecture on, on race and ethnicity, dealing with missions and, and elaborating on, on some more of these points. So I encourage you, if you haven't picked up a copy of the book, to do so. You can find it on Amazon, Answers in Genesis, Master Books is the publisher. Uh, the first printing sold out very quickly. The second printing uh, is probably ready here. Or whenever you're watching this, we've been offering pre-orders in case the, the, the copies run out. I've been very pleased with the response to this. I've been even more excited about the number of people who've contacted me wanting to participate in future research or questions about their own ancestry. If you're a long-standing follower of this research and you, you were following this way back in 2020, when I did a 25-part series with Ken Ham about the early stages of this research, we promised a book as part of that. This book, Traced, Human DNA is Big Surprise, is the fulfillment of that promise, contains the beginning of that research and so much more that's happened since then. And again, if you watch that series, you will know in 2020, I, I said, I don't, I don't know where Noah is. I've got a sense in the tree for where he is. Now this is one of those, this big new advance since that time. Again, would love to hear from you. I'm already advancing in, in various parts of the globe, various peoples from around the globe. This research further to uncover more of human history, to find some of the lost peoples of the ancient globe, uh, of the ancient world all around the globe. So contact me that way. You can also pick up this book on Amazon and Answers in Genesis. It's not a prerequisite for understanding traced, but hopefully you can see there's an organic connection between the two in terms of apologetic ramifications. I wrote this book specifically with a skeptical audience in mind, something you could give away to someone who doesn't hold a creation science. If you're a Christian and a creationist and say, well, just give me the cliff notes. That's what this book is all about, Replacing Darwin would have made simple. We've got a one hour video summary of this. You can see a lot more in terms of Answers in Genesis content on our streaming service, answers.tv. Highly encourage you to go to our website, answersingenesis.org. Thousands of articles. If you're a creation scientist wondering about the broader question of the Tower of Babel and things I didn't address in this lecture, you can find Bodhi Hodge's book, The Tower of Babel. More resources on the, on, on the issue of race and racism. Ken Ham, along with Charles Ware. So Ken Ham, of course, is Australian. Charles Ware is African-American. Together, they collaborated on this book, dealing with what the scripture says about race, the origin of races, and racism. Resources along these lines, lines, along these lines for kids as well. The textbook of our ministry is this book, The Lie by Ken Ham. And I'll say there's actually multiple textbooks. The answers books are core materials that cover the whole gamut. Most ask questions about creation science in geology, paleontology, biology, astronomy, the whole nine yards. Really, the fifth answers book is this book, The Flood of Evidence by uh, Ken Hammond and Bodhi Hodge that focuses specifically on those uh, centered on flood, ark, Noah, and such. We've got a bi-monthly magazine in which you can keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on in creation science. We are also the organization that has the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter here in Northern Kentucky. So if you come through this way, please pay us a visit. If you have questions, uh, again, there's, there's multiple ways to get in touch with me. There is that web portal that goes directly to my email. I'm also on social media, Facebook, though I don't know how long I'll be allowed to be on Facebook. So I've set up accounts and other platforms like MeWe and Parler and Telegram and Gab and Getter and such. You can find me there as well. I appreciate your attention and interest in this. 
topic. Again, I've been super excited by the amount of response that I've gotten from those who've either seen videos or followed the research and wanted to find out more about this. So again, appreciate all those who've paid attention to this, been participating in this, and I'm excited about where this is gonna go in the future. Thanks for the fan, y'all. It's a really fascinating look into the history of, of mankind through DNA, and I'm sure um, those who've watched it have, have really benefited. And if you if you haven't yet picked up your copy of Trace, then please uh, do so. The links for it are in the description below, or you can just go to answersandgenesis.org and make sure you get a copy today and pass it out to your family, to your friends, to people in your churches. And even if you're not a believer, I'd recommend um, you get a copy of this and look at some of the predictions that Dr. Jeanson has made as he's been talking about in this book. Fascinating um, new book, Traced, on the, the history of humanity in DNA. So Nathaniel, uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Simon. And just thank everyone for watching. And please do, as Nathaniel said, click on the other episodes in this series. So thank you for being with us today.